So last year, I went on a trip with my family to Disney World, and we were blown away by what we saw. From walking into Pandora and seeing the floating mountains, to fleeing stormtrooper fire that seemed to be coming right at us, there were amazing illusions everywhere. And as we walked through Disney World, it became pretty clear to me that Disney Imagineers have a really good understanding of the psychology behind how we perceive the world. But don't worry, if you take out your guided notes and follow along with this video, you too can have a good understanding of perception and all of the other concepts from Unit 2, Topic 1 of AP Psychology. All right, now when talking about perception, we are talking about how we interpret our sensory information which is information that comes from our five senses. Now, don't mix up perception with sensation. Remember, perception is about interpreting a stimulus, and sensation is about detecting a stimulus. For example, at Disney, if you go on the ride Soarin', you're lifted into the air, and your senses begin to take in information. Your eyes see vast landscapes, your ears hear a sweeping musical score, your skin feels a breeze, and your nose picks up on the scent of citrus and ocean air. This is sensation. Your body is detecting sensory inputs from the environment. Your brain then interprets all of these inputs and creates the perception that you're flying over the world. And that's the power of perception. Your mind takes sensory details and turns them into meaningful experiences. Now, when we interpret sensory data, we utilize either top-down or bottom-up processing. Top-down processing involves using prior knowledge and experiences to interpret the sensory information. This is what allows us to quickly make sense of what we are experiencing but it can also cause us to come to some faulty conclusions. For instance, take a look at this image. What do you see? Do you see a duck? Or perhaps you see a bunny. Did the image change as I asked these questions? If it did, it was because as I asked the questions, you got new information that shaped how you perceived the image. Another example would be when you're proofreading a paper, or in my case, a lesson or video script. You might miss spelling or grammar mistakes. Generally, it is because your brain knows what you meant to write and fills in the gaps, causing you to overlook errors that are actually there. This is known as the proofreader's illusion. It's a great example of how our expectations and prior knowledge can shape and sometimes distort what we perceive. That's why it's always helpful to have someone else review your work with fresh eyes. On the other hand, we also utilize bottom-up processing. Generally, we use this when we come across a stimuli or experience that is complex and not familiar to us. Bottom-up processing often takes longer for us to do, since we are building our perception from the ground up, organizing and interpreting the information as it comes in. When thinking about top-down and bottom-up processing, just try to think of it like you're completing a large, complex puzzle. If you've never seen the picture on the bottom, box and you're trying to piece the puzzle together solely on each individual piece, you're engaging in bottom-up processing. However, if you've seen the picture on the box or have done many puzzles before, you'll most likely start to organize the puzzle by the piece's color or shape, making it easier to complete the puzzle. Here, you're using your prior knowledge to guide your approach to the puzzle, which would be an example of top-down processing. To make sure you're understanding the difference between top-down and bottom-up processing, make sure you take my practice quiz in my ultimate review packet after this video is done. The quiz will make sure these concepts are really making sense. And if you do miss a question, no worries, I included an answer key that explains why each answer is either right or wrong. Remember, it's one thing to watch a video or read a textbook, but if you really want to make sure that you're understanding what you are learning, well, you need to practice and be active in your learning. All right, so it's no secret that every day we take in a ton of information. And to help make sense of all of it, our brain uses schemas and perceptual sets. Schemas are mental templates that help us organize information. Schemas are built from our past experiences. For example, all of you have had different experiences with teachers. You have a schema about how a teacher behaves. So when you meet someone for the first time and they say they are a teacher, you most likely automatically apply your schema to them, even if you do not know them personally. Now, this is different from a perceptual set, which is a mental shortcut your brain uses to quickly interpret what you are experiencing. Perceptual sets often influence our immediate perception based on our expectations or emotions, influencing how we interpret a stimuli in a specific moment. Schemas guide how we understand and 
respond to the world by fitting new information into pre-existing categories. While perceptual sets prime us to focus on certain aspects of sensory information and ignore other aspects, thus influencing our immediate perception of an object or situation. Generally, schemas operate over long periods of time, while perceptual sets are more short-term and situational. Perceptual sets are influenced by our past experiences, our motivation, emotional state, and the context of the situation. For instance, if you've ever been to Disney World, then you've probably gone on the Haunted Mansion. During this ride, you come across a ballroom scene where you see ghosts dancing and having a party. The effect is honestly amazing, and Disney primes the riders for this effect. The start of the ride does not have any ghosts. However, you are told spirits will materialize as you go through the ride. Your buggy constantly turns and shifts and face you towards specific parts of the ride, thus focusing your attention to what Disney wants you to see. This allows Disney then to utilize different lighting and sound effects to influence your perception, eventually leading you to the ballroom scene where they utilize an effect known as Pepper's Ghost. What you are looking at here is actually a reflection on a piece of glass, yet your brain perceives this scene as ghost dancing. Now we can't talk about perceptual sets without also talking about perceptual principles that were proposed by Gestalt psychology. Gestalt psychology focuses on how humans naturally group elements together to form meaningful patterns. Instead of processing individual components of a stimuli, our brains tend to interpret a stimuli as a unified whole. Now, the first principle is figure and ground, which states that when perceiving something, our visual system breaks what we are viewing down into two categories. The first is figure, which is the object of focus, and the second is ground, which is the background. This distinction helps us quickly identify important information while filtering out the rest. Up next, there is closure, which states that our brain subconsciously fills in missing information when viewing a familiar but incomplete object. Then there is similarity, which refers to how we perceive a group of similar objects or patterns as one cohesive unit. This principle also explains why even though a group or pattern is separate, we still see it as one object. This principle actually also addresses why when we see an anomaly, which is when an object is different from others, it becomes the focal point and stands out. Then there is proximity, which states that when objects are placed close to each other, they are often perceived as one single group. And when objects are spaced farther apart, they are seen as separate entities. And lastly, there is continuation and symmetry. Continuation states that we will continue following continuous lines or paths. For example, when you see an exit sign with an arrow, your gaze is drawn outwards, leading you out towards the exit. While symmetry states that when objects are symmetrical to each other, we often perceive them as one object, rather than individual separate elements. We can see that each of these principles plays a role in how we perceive the world around us, helping us organize information into meaningful patterns. All right, so those are the Gestalt principles. And if you are still not sure about perception or these principles, then make sure to check out my ultimate review packet after this video. I created different practice quizzes that focus on these concepts. Plus, I added explanations breaking down each answer and question, just to make sure that you understand everything. Now, I mentioned our visual system and Honestly, to fully understand the complexities within this system, we need to talk about depth perception, which is the ability to perceive relative distance of an object in one's visual field. Our ability to perceive depth comes from our binocular and monocular cues. Binocular cues rely on both eyes, working together. When we look at something up close to us, our eyes actually move inward. And when we focus on something farther away, our eyes straighten out. This process is called convergence. When looking at an object, each of our eyes sees a slightly different view of the object. This creates a sense of depth. The difference between the two images is known as retinal disparity. Binocular cues use these differences between the eye's image to give us our depth perception. Monocular cues, on the other hand, rely on just one eye, and they help us judge depth and distance in everyday situations, like looking at photos or distant objects. Unlike binocular 
binocular cues, they don't depend on both eyes working together, but instead on visual information that one eye alone can pick up. Let's actually take a minute now and break down the different types of monocular cues. First up is relative size, which allows us to determine how close an object is. Objects that are closer to us will appear larger, while objects that are farther away will appear smaller. Then there's interposition, which occurs when one object blocks another. The object being blocked is perceived as farther away, while the one doing the blocking is seen as closer. Up next is relative height, which tells us that objects higher in our visual field appear farther away, while objects that are lower in our visual field seem closer. Next is texture and gradient, which also plays a role in depth perception. Objects that are clear and in focus and full of detail appear closer than objects that lack detail and appear more blurry. Then lastly, there is linear perspective, which is when parallel lines seem to converge in the distance, giving us a sense of depth and positioning. Now, one another monocular cue that I want to mention is the motion parallax, which you could probably guess, but it does involve motion. Here we can see that objects closer to you appear to move quickly, while those that are farther away seem to move more slowly. This is why if you look out a car window, nearby cars seem to speed by, but distant landscapes and clouds appear to be slowly moving. Now going back to Disney, we can actually see that a lot of the illusions they rely on use the different gestalt principles are benign monocular cues and our monocular cues. For instance, if you walk down Main Street USA, you will notice the massive castle at the end. However, the castle's actually not as big as it looks. As you walk down Main Street, you quickly notice all of the buildings that line the road. They're all the same color palette. They have similar architecture and are placed close together. This is to get your brain to group them all as one coherent town. Main Street also narrows slightly as you walk down it, making the castle seem even farther away and larger than it is, which is complemented by the fact that Disney placed the castle higher than everything else. Again, leading your brain to believe that the castle is bigger than it really is. Now, if you pay attention, you'll also notice that the street is designed to pull your eyes straight towards the castle. Your brain follows the smooth lines and curves of the path, guiding you forward without even realizing it. Once you look at the castle, you will immediately focus on it, since the castle stands out clearly against the blue sky. Disney made sure to keep the background clear, so that your focus is on the object that they want you to see. To help sell the effect, Disney also uses force perspective throughout all of Main Street. In fact, the buildings on Main Street, while well, the first floor of the building is normal. However, each floor above it actually gets smaller, giving the illusion that the buildings are really taller than they are. And the same is true about the castle. The windows and the bricks at the top are actually smaller than those at the bottom, giving you the illusion that the castle is larger than it really is. Speaking of the bricks and windows, you'll also notice that the detail work on the castle, and honestly, any Disney building is more clear near the street level. And this is intentional. The bricks near the top appear to be smooth, which reinforces the idea in your brain that the castle is tall and far away. So we can see that Disney is constantly playing tricks on our visual system to create a very specific experience for each guest. All of these gestalt principles and depth perception tricks work together to create their illusions. Now don't worry, if you do need help keeping the different binocular and monocular cues straight, of course, I created a practice quiz and put it in the ultimate review packet. You can check it out once you're done with this video. Okay, so we've talked about a lot of stuff in this video already, but we still need to talk about how our attention impacts our perception. Oftentimes, when we are focusing on certain stimuli, we often end up tuning out other stimuli in our environment. And this is known as selective attention, a concept that going back to Disney is, well, well aware of. Disney actually created their own paint color called Go Away Green, and they use this to paint objects that they don't want you to see. Disney intentionally draws your attention to certain items on the rides and certain parts of the park to get you to focus your attention, while at the same time ignoring or missing other items. Another example of selective attention in action would be you going to a party and hanging out with your friends. At the party, I'm sure there's a lot of people talking. The music is bumping, but you still can have a 
conversation with your friends when they're right in front of you. Your brain is able to use selective attention to tune out the background noise and help you concentrate on what matters to you in that moment. But the cool thing here is that even though you're not paying attention to everything else that's going on around you, your brain still secretly listens in. So if someone across the room suddenly says your name or starts talking about your favorite celebrity or something dramatic, your ears can perk up and your attention will shift. And this ability to stay focused on one voice while still being able to detect something that's personally important to you in the background is called the cocktail party effect which again just shows how amazing the brain is. Now, speaking of attention, we also need to talk about what happens when we divide our attention. Oftentimes we experience a phenomenon known as inattentional blindness, which is a failure to notice a stimuli in our visual field due to our attention being focused elsewhere. Another phenomenon that could also occur when our attention is divided is change blindness, which is a type of inattentional blindness where we fail to notice changes in the environment. These phenomena illustrate the limitations and selective nature of human attention, showing how we can focus on certain stimuli while remaining oblivious to others. All right, now we have one more concept to review, and that is apparent movement, which is when your brain perceives motion even though nothing is actually moving. This illusion happens because of visual cues and timing that end up tricking your brain into thinking that something is in motion. One example of this is stroboscopic motion, which is commonly used in animations and movies. Here, the illusion of movement is created by showing a series of images in rapid succession, resulting in the brain perceiving motion. Another example is the phi phenomenon, which occurs when lights blink on and off in a sequence, resulting in us perceiving objects as moving even though they are actually stationary. Next, there is induced movement, which is when a stationary object appears to move because of the motion of the surrounding objects. And finally, there's the autokinetic effect, which is when a stationary point of light in a dark environment appears to move. And this happens because the eyes and the brain actually have a difficult time maintaining a stable perception of the light's position, since there is no other visual references. Now, I realize there was a lot there, so to keep all the different phenomena straight, I created a practice quiz that will help you check your understanding. And of course, I included explanations for all the different answers. All right, so there you have it. That was our introduction into perception. Now comes the time to practice what we have learned. Don't forget to check your answers in the comment section down below and consider subscribing if you found value in this video. As always, I'm Mr. Sin. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time online.